Karen and Chance from ediblewildfood.com here on a very chilly autumn day. In fact, this evening we're going below freezing. And even though the evenings are cold, the daytime temperatures are over the freezing mark. And that means there can be bugs lurking in there. Oh yeah, <laughs> but the one in particular that this video is about, ticks. Just because it's a chilly day, just because it's autumn, and actually, depending on where you are, even in winter time, ticks can be out there. So stay tuned. As foragers, we need to know as much as we can to arm ourselves with good information to prevent getting ticks on us. I've done a lot of videos over the years and I've enjoyed doing each and every one of them. And this is no exception. Of course, this isn't a fun video about plant identification or fungi. This is something very serious. It's about ticks and Lyme disease. I truly hope that there's enough information in here that will help you not only learn a little bit about ticks, but if you should ever have one on you, Hopefully you can get some information on this video in terms of what you can do to expedite getting help. So let's go. There are about 850 different tick species worldwide, and over 90 of these can be found throughout the United States. More than 40 different types of ticks are in Canada. Ticks have the potential to carry bacteria, parasites, and viruses that cause disease. Now, not every tick does, first of all, so we have to make that very clear. A lot of them do, but not all ticks. These diseases can cause severe harm to wildlife, to our pets, as well as to us. Many of these diseases can be fatal if not diagnosed and treated quickly. With so many different species of ticks out there, I'm certainly not gonna have enough time to show you each and every type of tick that is out there. However, I'm just gonna show you four of the more common ones. As you can see right here, there's the black-legged tick and the Western black-legged tick. And here is the dog tick and the Lone Star Tick. Black-legged ticks have a two to three year life cycle. During this time, they go through four life stages, egg, larva, nymph, and adult. After the egg hatches, the larva and nymph must each take a blood meal to develop to the next life stage, and the female needs blood to produce eggs. Larval and nymphal ticks can become infected with Lyme disease bacteria when feeding on an infected wildlife host, usually a rodent. The bacteria are passed along to the next life stage. Nymphs or adult females can then spread the bacteria during their next blood meal. Female ticks infected with Lyme disease bacteria do not pass it on to their offspring. Tick eggs are often laid in the springtime after female ticks complete their two to three year lifespan. As you can see, the eggs are uh, somewhat brown, translucent, and one tick can lay thousands of eggs, up to 6,000 eggs. This image from the CDC shows you the three different types of ticks and their size in relationship to a dime. Now, what's really interesting is that a nymph basically is the size of a poppy seed and the adult is the size of a sesame seed. And if you wanna take a look at that a bit more, you can always pause the video. At the time of working on this video, these are all the different types of pathogens that I've been able to find 
that any one of us can get through an infected tick. Now, I'm not gonna list off all these. If you wanna read these, please pause the video and take a look. But each and every one of these can cause absolute chaos to our health. And from what I can ascertain, I think Powassan virus is one of the worst. Powassan virus is a rare infection, but it's more serious than Lyme disease. Powassan virus can lead to neurological problems such as spinal cord swelling and encephalitis. At this time, it seems to be that the only cases of Powassan are around the Great Lakes region and the Northeast United States and Canada. Lincoln Byers was five years old in September 1958. He was playing outside when a tick bit him near Powassan, Ontario. Lincoln soon fell ill and after seeing a local doctor, he was rushed to Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. He had a horrible fever. He complained of dizziness and a headache, and he had went into a coma. Within days, he passed away. An autopsy revealed that Lincoln had swelling in his brain. According to Dr. Jennifer Lyons, an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard, about 15% of patients who are infected and have symptoms are not going to survive. That's kind of scary. And of the survivors, at least 50% of those are gonna have long-term neurological damage that cannot be resolved. This is an illustration that I drew to show you the, the structure of a tick. As you can see on the front left leg, and I think it might be on the front right leg as well, I'm not 100% sure, there's something called the Haller's organ. And the Haller's organ is what signifies to the tick that a potential host is coming very, very close. So it's getting ready to make the transfer. Technically, ticks can go weeks, and I think even months, without having any, any food whatsoever, which is quite amazing. And but the, it's those Haller organs that, or the Haller's organ, that lets it know that there's a host coming, and whether it be in a tree or a shrub, on a plant, grass, that's is getting ready to make the transfer onto its host. A tick has something called a hypostome. It doesn't have, um, it, it's not like um, a lot of other insects that can actually physically bite you. It's not biting us. It inserts its hypostome into our skin. And from that hypostome, that's where it's, it feeds and regurgitates back into our body. The hypostome kind of has the appearance of a saw. There's a lot of information out there that indicates or they, that shows us that a tick has to be feeding on us 24 to 48 hours before any transfer of bacteria can happen, and this is not the case. It can happen in a matter of a couple of hours. Now, what happens is that the tick, it starts feeding on its host, and almost, it doesn't take that much uh, time at all, and it starts to vomit it back. It regurgitates. Ticks only want the red blood cells, not the white blood cells. And so as soon as that regurgitation happens, that's when what's called the spirochets enter our bloodstream. And from there, those spirochets multiply and they get into, they, they wanna make their way into um, like our tendons, our joints. They like to stay away from active blood flow. And this is why a lot of times Lyme disease mimics arthritis. That's because it's affecting our joints and that's where those spirochets tend to like to, to gravitate to. Now, most people are bitten by the nymph tick, which is the teenager. And nymphs are responsible for 75% of human infections and the adult female tick accounts for only 25%. There is a lot of information that indicates that the transfer, uh, the infection can happen like anywhere from four to six hours up to 48 hours. This is an illustration that shows 
a little bit how a tick can grow in a very short period of time when it's been feeding. When it's at its uh, when it's had its complete fill, it has that really big gray bulbous uh, look, and it's really disgusting looking. And I had shown an image of that earlier in this part of the video. Anyway, there's there's other information out there that we don't really hear a lot about. And Dr. Petra Hoff Seidel, who is a German uh, researcher, her work in this field has been very inspirational for me to learn more about the tick and Lyme disease. Regardless, though, um, her information and her research indicates that uh, in addition to transmission uh, by ticks and other carriers, there is evidence of intrauterine transmission of Borrelia spirochets by infected mothers to their fetuses. And that is absolutely terrifying. In addition, she says that there's documented and, a, and actually a published case of George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, and she contracted Lyme disease from George Bush through sexual transmission. This is this is definitely a, a possibility. It doesn't happen in all cases, but it is definitely something to always be aware of. Very important information. Ticks are more active in the early spring months as well as the late autumn months because they enjoy the cooler temperatures. In the heat of the summer, they're pretty much dormant. They don't like to be active. And when winter comes around, a lot of people think that's it, we're safe, the snow has fallen, and that isn't always the case. More often than not in the winter time, depending on where you live, the temperature can still get to zero degrees Celsius, that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And as soon as that um, temperature gets to that level, the ticks can become active again. In fact, they do. There was one year, it was minus one, which is just a, a hairline uh, lower than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I was out hiking and I came home with a tick on me. Luckily, I saw it right away. So always be on guard. And if you have a pet and you're giving your pet any kind of special uh, treatments, uh, there's different treatments out there that help to repel ticks on our dogs. You have to remember, depending on where you live, your pet will need this every month of the year. It's gotten to a point where the two places where I used to collect fiddleheads are so incredibly tick infested. I don't care about fiddleheads anymore. It's not worth it because every time guaranteed I've got ticks on me and it doesn't matter how much I love fiddleheads, it's not worth it anymore. But when I go out foraging for other goodies, I always wear light colored pants and long sleeve shirts. That's very important because the lighter the color of the clothing that you wear, the easier it's gonna to be to spot if you have a tick on you. Tuck your shirt into your pants and tuck your pants into your socks. Wear closed toe shoes. If you can, Use bug spray with DEET or Icaridin, but please make sure that you follow the label directions. Now, I know everything out there says make sure that you're walking on cleared paths and, or walkways. That's not possible as foragers because as you know, you gotta get into the bush in order to find a lot of the goodies, especially when it comes to fungi. So all I can do is recommend that Make sure you're wearing light color clothing. Make sure your head is protected as well. Don't be touching any low lying branches because if your head touches a low lying branch, you're gonna have a tick there. And if it gets onto your head, you're not gonna see it. So you have to be very, very careful not to touch anything while you're out there. There is clothing out there that's treated with permethrin. That's always a possibility. And, but you have to be careful too, because just because something's treated with a known chemical that repels ticks doesn't necessarily mean that it works. I once purchased a pair of permethrin treated pants and it was the first time I wore them and first time out, I saw a tick on my leg and it wasn't um, walking quickly. It was just kind of meandering along. 
So don't always trust that type of clothing. And always, always, when you're out there, do frequent tick checks. If you're with a friend, have somebody check your backside to make sure there isn't any ticks on your backside. And of course, check, you know, be sure to check your friend as well. Frequently, every 10 to 15 minutes, depending on, on how much into the bush you, you are. Always do that. It's very important. Let's say you get home from foraging and you are in your house and all of a sudden you realize you see a tick on you. Don't panic. What you're going to do is, first of all, if it's it's there and it hasn't latched on you, get a, a Ziploc bag, put the tick in that bag, seal it and throw it into the garbage. You don't want to throw it into your garden. You don't want to throw it outside because then that tick is on your property. So don't do that. Now, if you have a tick on you and obviously it's been feeding, don't remove that tick with your fingers ever. Don't squeeze it, don't crush it, don't twist it, don't squash it. Um, never burn it, never put alcohol on it. Um, don't do those things. Some people may question why I say don't remove ticks with tweezers. The reason why I say that is because the tweezers sometimes, depending on the type of tweezers people use, can cause more damage than good. So, uh, for example, there's one person I know, she used tweezers, and because it was the wrong tweezers, she ended up snapping the, the ticks, so the hypostome was still in her. That's not good. This is why I recommend using a tick key. And a tick key is absolutely a great invention and it works like a charm. Once you've removed a tick from your, uh, from your skin, always wash it with soap and water. Once you have removed a tick from your body, the first thing you need to do is get it into a Ziploc bag, seal it and put it in the freezer. The next step is you want to get that tick tested. Check out to see what labs are within your area or what labs are available that you can mail the tick to. There's, there are some services in the United States that I know do that, and I will find a few of those and put them in the description below. If you're in Canada, there's Genetix, and you mail the tick in, and depending on the service that you require, you can have it tested for just the uh, Borrelium uh, that can cause Lyme disease, or you can have it tested for all pathogens. I think that's essential because Lyme disease isn't just the only disease you can get from these things. So you wanna make sure that all your bases are covered. In the meantime, depending on what route you take, some, I know from uh, Genetix, which is local to me, I can get results back very quickly. So I know whether the ticket has any pathogen and what is the next course of action I need to take. Depending on where you live, it may take a while to have that tick tested. Now, it's essential to find out within a two week period whether that tick is infected or not because doxycycline is the, is the um, antibiotic of choice that works for a lot of people and it has to start, that treatment has to start within two weeks of getting that tick off your body. You have a very close, a very closed window in terms of time. So all I can say, it's really important, get the tick tested, then you know what you're dealing with. But in the meantime, I know there are a lot of clinics and hospitals in Eastern Ontario, I live in the province of Ontario, that they don't even ask questions. You walk in there, you say you had a tick on you, they will give you doxycycline, no questions asked, because they know that there's a very, very short window of time that you have to start that antibiotic protocol in order to divert the possibility of getting Lyme disease. Anyways, I could go on and on and on about this, but I'm gonna cut this off right here. And the next portion of this video is an interview that I did with Justin Woods. He is the owner of Genetics in uh, Uxbridge, Ontario, and 
instead of me continuing to talk, I'm going to go right into that. I'm in Uxbridge, Ontario, and I'm about to have an interview with Justin Woods, who founded Genetics. And this is the inside of Genetics. And here is the man that made it all happen, Justin. Hi, Justin. Hello. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your background, your educational background? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science with Honors from Queen's University that was specializing in molecular biology and genetics. And I have a Master's from the University of Calgary in Functional Genomics, which is a branch of genetics. Okay. And you were an active outdoorsman when you were in Alberta? Yes, I was an active outdoorsman for most of my life and a very active athlete until, unfortunately, I contracted Lyme disease when I was probably around 20 years old, and that uh, drastically changed my life. Oh my, that's, and it's probably affected your life in ways you never would imagine. Yes, absolutely. I think that my life has taken a completely different trajectory over the last 10 to 15 years than I would have ever been able to anticipate. I can't imagine what life would be like living with Lyme disease, and I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. But you managed to take something incredibly negative and turn it into something amazing, something positive. Can you talk to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for recognizing that. It was a very difficult time, and uh, I think sort of as a blessing through that time as I was able to meet a lot of people that were involved in Lyme disease research and doctors that were uh, very concerned for their patients that were going through this. Mm -hmm. And uh, given my educational background, that afforded me the opportunity to get involved in that space. And after uh, recovering from my illness, uh, I had the opportunity to start this lab, which is uh, genetics, and it's a tick testing lab and we're able to focus on testing ticks for various pathogens that might be carried and give people an opportunity to assess their exposure to tick-borne diseases after they've encountered or been bitten by ticks. Wonderful. And this is, this is incredible. This is not what a normal person would think when they're thinking a lab. They would, ex they would think maybe 4,000 square feet or 2,000 square feet, and it all happens here. Yeah. We don't need uh, a huge amount of space to do the sort of work that we do. And I think it's actually quite important for science and scientists to be able to uh, excessively do this kind of work. It shouldn't really be something that's gated behind uh, you know, really expensive, difficult labs to get into. So we're very happy to be able to make it happen in a, quite a small space, all things considered. Kudos to you. This is just fantastic. Thank you. So this is a black-legged tick being examined. And why is it important that people should always get a tick tested? Yeah, I think the importance of testing ticks is it allows you to assess your exposure to tick-borne pathogens very quickly. And one of the most important things for Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases is to get treatment very quickly. So the more quickly you get treatment, the better the prognosis is, and the more likely you are to eradicate any infection very uh, quickly. So with tick testing, we're able to assess what kind of pathogens were present in the tick, and then with the help of a physician or a trained uh, healthcare provider, you can then make decisions about what the best course of action is in terms of early treatment, antibiotics, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, if you just kind of go the standard route of serology, you actually have to wait six to eight weeks before you can even determine if uh, you know, that test works or not. And it tends to be a little bit inaccurate, in, especially in the early exposure. And the other hallmarks of Lyme disease, like the bullseye rash and that sort of thing, uh, are not actually present in every case. So you may have been bit by a tick and not see a bullseye rash and think, oh, I don't have Lyme disease. But unfortunately, the bullseye rash is not uh, present in every single case. Often it can be lower than 50% of cases, and it doesn't always look like a hallmark bullseye rash. And uh, on top of that, there's other pathogens that can be present in ticks that will not cause that type of rash. And if you don't 
know to look for those, then you wouldn't know that they're in that pick, and you wouldn't know you've been exposed to them. Like the one I had last autumn that I gave you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which tested positive for Babesia otocolori? Babesia otocolii. Got it. All right. Now I have it on video. I'll always remember it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, Justin, for your time. I truly appreciate it. Uh, all my viewers, I'm sure, have absolutely enjoyed this segment of the video, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.